You all did a great job. Thank you very much. And Nina and Amy and Vicky and all the people that directed this and Don and Kathy playing. It was fabulous. Let me tell you what you saw in case you missed it. Because you may have missed it. You know, the first thing that you are led to believe <clears throat> right from the very beginning is that Jonah is called a prophet. And when someone is called a prophet, typically what that means is they're following the Lord, they know the Lord, they're listening to the Lord, and then they're conveying the word of the Lord to people. And we have many examples in Scripture. We have Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and the minor prophets. But Jonah is a little unique in that it's clear that Jonah knows the Lord because he recognizes the Lord's voice. It's clear he not only recognizes the Lord's voice, but what the Lord calls him to do. He clearly is part of the covenant people and has a covenant relationship with the people. But the reality is that when the Lord specifically calls him to be the prophet that the Lord wants him to be, what is Jonah's response? No chance. And it's interesting because in a lot of ways, you may know the Lord. You may know what the Lord's call on your life is. You may recognize his voice, so to say. You may be walking with him in a lot of ways, but... He has a call on each of our lives. He has a call on us collectively, all of us to be his church, to follow his word. But he has a call on each of our lives, specifically, personally. And it's interesting because, again, you think Jonah's going to be the hero in this story. Most prophets are the ones who bring the word of the Lord, who are the faithful witnesses. It's not Jonah who's the hero. God is the one. God is trying to show grace and mercy to a people that are horribly evil. And if you don't know the situation, it's important to know the historical context. Because the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, because Israel was split in two, Judah and Israel, 721, the Assyrians conquered Israel. And Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. And so what happens at this point is that when they're conquered at that time, the people who are in positions of authority and power and education and wealth, influence, they are all taken away by the captors. It happened in the northern kingdom with Assyria. It happened years later, 587, with Judah in the southern kingdom. The Babylonians would take them away. And so only the poor of the land were left. And they basically said... You know, they can't organize a rebellion, so it's fine for them to continue to work the land. At least we'll have some people there. But when the Assyrians took people away, they took them with hooks hooked to each other. Not handcuffs and chains, hooks. And then they would drag them away, basically. They would have to keep up with being hooked through the flesh. They were a brutal, cruel people. And so when the Lord called Jonah and said, I want you to go to Nineveh, the capital, which would be considered the center of evil for the Israelites who were conquered, he said, I'm not doing that. Because God, I know enough about you from my own experience and from your word and from dealing with your people that you're going to show grace and mercy. I have no interest in you showing grace and mercy to them. I don't know that that's our call. You know, and there are times in our lives when we want to say, God, you don't have this quite right. I know what really needs to happen. You need to come down and punish these people. That's what's right. I know you're a, a, a gracious, merciful, loving, forgiving God, but not for a people like that. And we don't have that position, place, or right to do that. And so what does God do? God calls him to go to Nineveh. Jonah boards a boat to Spain, opposite direction. And by the way, most of the Israelites would be afraid of the sea. 
because it was considered the source of chaos. So he's even taking a risk, boarding a boat and going, okay? Just so you're clear in what Jonah has this probably ambivalence, but this is a better option. So he boards a boat, heads towards Spain, and a storm arises that the sailors recognize enough because they've been used to the sea. This is not a normal storm. There's something wrong. There's something different. And so everybody needs to pray to their God, which is what the typical pagan culture was. There's all kinds of different gods, so you just pray to your God. We'll see which one works. But we got it covered that way. And Jonah's asleep. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. He doesn't want to deal with anybody. He doesn't want to share God's grace and mercy with anyone, including the sailors. They wake him up and say, Jonah, you got to pray to your God. And Jonah says, no, you need to understand my God is the God. And if I, I'm the problem here. So just throw me overboard. I would rather get thrown overboard and take my chances in a stormy sea than go to Nineveh. And he probably realized his chances of survival were very, very slim but it's better than going to Nineveh. That's how much he hated even the prospect of bringing the message to such a people. The sailors said, no, we're not going to do that. And Jonah said, it's the only way you're going to get out of this. So Jonah gets thrown overboard. The sailors recognize because the sea calms and the wind cease. This is really the God that we should be worshiping, and they worship him. Jonah had said nothing to them about who God is. They recognized enough. So Jonah ends up going to Nineveh reluctantly. And what the scripture says, it's a very fascinating thing, that it's a three days journey to walk across Nineveh. I don't know how many of you walked across cities in your life. There's I can't imagine any city that would take three days to wander across, particularly a city of 120,000 people. Here's what I think it is. Jonah's going like, I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. So he stops for coffee. (laughs) And he keeps going, and a couple hours later, he stops for lunch. And then he takes a siesta. You know, he is a reluctant prophet. And if you look what he says, he never uses the name God at all. Never. He said, this city's going to be destroyed unless you repent. So once again, Jonah does not mention the name God. He's a terrible witness. He's not exactly being the best prophet in the world because he wants God to punish Nineveh. And so everybody responds, and the king says, you know, we're all going to fast and we're all going to pray. And Jonah says, I knew it! I can't believe it! You really are going to show them grace and mercy. They really did repent. And he goes out to the east side of the city. Now, you have to remember, the the sea is on the west, so he's walked through the city, now he's on the east side. The east side in Scripture, if you see that, that means that's where judgment's coming from. So when he sets himself up on the east side, he's saying, I want to watch you judge him. That's what you need to do, God. You need to do this. I really don't like that you sent me here. I really don't like that they're repenting. It's not what you should be doing. Judge them. And then the Lord gives him a bush. Here's the third clue. And the bush grows up. Jonah did nothing to produce the bush. And it gives him shade. And then the tree has a worm and dies. And Jonah said, I'm really getting tired of this. Everything is not going my way. But what he failed to recognize is, once again, God showed grace to him. God showed grace with the sailors. God showed grace with the Ninevites. God showed grace with the plant. Don't miss what's going on here. Jonah is like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. But the younger brother who was rebellious repents. And the older brother is standing outside saying, I really don't get how you operate, God. 
Father, you're just too gracious to people. You're too forgiving. Instead of saying, God in his grace and mercy and love is incredible in his forgiveness. And we see it the most with Jesus on the cross. When Jesus went to the cross for you and I, while we were living apart from God, because of God's grace and mercy, says, I want to forgive you. I want you to understand the depth of my love and forgiveness for you. And that's the story of Jonah. Jonah's like the older brother sitting outside and we don't know what decision he finally comes to. But part of the lesson for you and I is that we need to understand the depth of God's love and grace and mercy and how much he wants to reach each one of us. Collectively is the church that we understand that he is the God who is full of grace and full of forgiveness and wants us to walk with him and respond to his word. And yet so many times in our lives say, Lord, you know, I know what your word says, but really, this is who I am and this is what I should be doing. So you really need to understand, God, what this is. Instead of saying, yes, Lord. I recognize the depth of your love for me and your grace. And I recognize my need. And each one of us has an individual call in our lives. God is calling each of us to do something, to respond to him, so that we might respond to other people in ministry, in mission, in care, in sharing the gospel. And once again, we can say to God, no, no, that's not really what I want to be about. I've got so many other things I want to do, Lord. That's what I want to be about. And we become like Jonah. God has a call on your life. First and foremost, that you would know his grace and mercy. That you would know his forgiveness, the depth of his love, demonstrated by Jesus on the cross. And he has a call on his church collectively to walk with him and to be his people. But he has a call on your life to respond in a specific way. And we need, like Jonah, not only just to hear his voice, but to respond to his voice. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of our children, for those who have worked with them, for those who serve to facilitate this story for us. And Lord, we pray as we Think about Jonah in his life, in his ministry. Help us to learn from him and help us to learn from you, especially because of your son Jesus and his cross, the power of the resurrection, the power of the Holy Spirit to change us and equip us, to open doors and to use us. Lord, we pray that as this story, these songs have penetrated the hearts of the children here, so it would change their lives, and so this story would change us. By your Holy Spirit, and in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen.